So there have been protests against the US trade deal right across the UK today. Um, there have been activities and protests in um, in Eyre, in Barnsley, in Bexhill, Bournemouth, Bradford, Cambridge, Cleveland, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Central London, Ealing and Clapham, Macclesfield, Manchester, Merseyside, Nottingham, Oswestry, Oxford. Portsmouth, Reading and York and probably more that I don't know about. So there's things, been things going on right across the UK today plus loads more people um, adding their photos and voices on social media. So uh, I should introduce myself. Um, I'm Liz Murray and I'm coming to you from Edinburgh. I work for Global Justice Now in our office in Scotland. Um, that's a great pumpkin. Thanks very much, everyone, for coming. Um, this uh, this is a, an, on, an online rally, and it's a culmination of a day of action, as I've said, across the UK, um, as we've just seen, um, seen from the photos. And today was organised and supported by Global Justice Now, um, War on Want, Keep Our NHS Public, We Own It, Tradecraft, Open Rights Group, Some of Us, Compassion in Well Farming, um, Another Europe is Possible, and the Stop Trump Coalition, plus all of you, of course. <laughs> um, and it's it's really clear that there's huge and growing public concern about the trade deal that the UK government is right now negotiating with the US. Um, and there's also a growing campaign to stop it, as today has shown us. So let's use today to re-energize ourselves, to keep fighting, um, because whoever wins the US election, we still need to stop this corporate driven trade deal. Um, we know that this trade deal and others like it are about so much more than trade. Um, a trade deal with the US means an attack on regulations and standards that we, that we as a society have chosen to put in place to protect our food, the environment, animal welfare, workers, human rights. It's a push for privatization, it's a threat to democracy and it hands huge powers to multinational corporations. So this isn't about the UK versus the US, it's about people versus corporations. Um, and we know we can win. Many of you will have been involved in the pan-European um, and transatlantic campaign to stop TTIP, the EU-US trade deal. Um, and the massive public opposition to that deal means that that's now in the long grass. So let's take heart from that um, and uh, keep fighting. Um, and on that upbeat note, um, I want to thank all our speakers at tonight's rally um, and say how much we're looking forward to hearing from them. Um, so now on to um, our speakers. The first um, one is um, George Monbiot, who I'm sure everybody knows um, as an author, activist and Guardian journalist. From the government's point of view, a trade deal with the US is the perfect way of ripping down the public protections that have been in its sights for a long time. It wants to destroy effective regulation, environmental regulation, food standards, health and safety, environmental health, consumer protection. All these it sees as obstacles to something it calls the market. And by the market, it means the power of money. The market is a euphemism. And it's a power of particular kinds of money. It's the power of dirty money. Because in politics, we have something called the pollution paradox that operates. And what this means is that it's the dirtiest companies, the, the ones who've got the most to hide, who've got the greatest incentive to invest in politics. If they're clean companies, they don't have anything to fear from the electorate. If they're dirty companies, there'll always be a demand to regulate them and to prevent them from dumping their costs on other people and onto the living world. So those are the people who pour money into politics. They're the people who fund parties, such as the Conservative Party, um, who, who pay to go to the grand dinners with Conservative ministers. And what they want is for regulations and taxes to be pulled down. But of course, 
most people don't want those public protections to be destroyed. We want good food. We, we want a thriving living world. We want to have good lives. We don't want to be living in a toxic wasteland. Um, and we would never vote for that. So, so a government which has been funded by dirty money has to find other ways of getting around the electorate and pulling down regulations without our consent. And this US trade deal is a perfect example of how that can be done. Because without even the consent of parliament, it would lock in deregulation in a way that can't be democratically challenged. It would also enable companies to sue any future government through an offshore tribunal for any public protections that, it, that, that those companies don't like and to have them removed again without the consent of parliament or the people. So while this is being presented to us just as a matter of free trade and prosperity and access to consumer choice, there's a very dark agenda underneath it, which is all about ensuring that the worst companies, the dirtiest companies, can get away pretty well with what they like and dump their costs on the rest of us. So oh, that's a um, telling it as it is start from, jo from George Monbiot. Um, so the, obviously it's the, a trade deal with the US is going to have impacts in many aspects, uh, um, many areas of our lives. Um, and one of those areas is um, potentially in public services and the NHS. Um, and so I'll um, want to hand over now to Dr. Sonia Adesara. Um, and Sonia is a medical doctor and also an activist on many fronts, um, including with Keep Our NHS Public, who she spe um, speaks frequently on many health issues for, and she is particularly interested in migrant and women's health and inequalities. So thank you, Sonia. Thank you for having me and good evening, everyone at home. So when the Tories tell us that the NHS is not for sale, not on the table, this is simply dishonest, disingenuous nonsense. So our NHS is already on the table. Private companies, including US companies, are already taking over NHS contracts. Um, and under the, the, the Coalition Government's Health and Social Care Act, NHS trusts have to put out services to competitive tendering. So unless we have legislative changes, our NHS will automatically be involved in a US trade deal. And if there is any doubt about the government's intention on this, the government just this summer voted against amendments to the trade bill that would have protected, put in the necessary safeguards to protect our NHS. So the backdoor privatisation of our NHS started under Thatcher, but it has accelerated in recent years. So pre-COVID, about 18% of NHS funds was going to the private sector. Um, and it's likely that has, that has grown in recent months. And now a US trade deal is not going to suddenly mean that we're going to see, you know, up for sale signs outside your local hospital, but the US trade deal will, under international law, lock in the market into our NHS. So this will not only, you know, accelerate privatisation, but it will make it extremely difficult for future governments to then um, reverse that privatisation and take our NHS back fully into, into, into public hands. And um, so I've been accused of being, you know, anti-private sector. Um, and, you know, I guess my, my opposition to private sector involvement in healthcare is not simply because I dislike um, NHS taxpayers' money lining pockets of shareholders, but it's because I do not want to see the care of my patients compromised. And time and time and time again, we see when private companies take over healthcare services, they cut corners to maximize profit. And it is patients, it is us, who suffer the consequences. The trade deal will also impact the cost of drugs. Um, so in the UK, because of, because of NICE and because of the bulk buying power that we have in the NHS, we in the UK pay a lot less for drugs um, compared to the US, despite the, so we are paying um, up to four times less than the Americans do for drugs. And the US ne trade negotiators have made it explicitly clear that they want to address this. They want to tackle the regulatory bodies. They want to weaken NICE. Um, and if we were to end up paying the same amount that the Americans do for, 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 drug, for pharma, pharmaceutical drugs, our 
drugs bill um, could, could equal an extra 519 million pounds a week for the NHS. So the consequences of this, of course, will be that the NHS won't be able to offer all the drugs. Um, and inevitably, this will mean that people that, who have the means will end up trying to access these drugs privately. So we will end up with a two-tier system. And, of course, and also, you know, there are countries across the world that use UK drug pricing as a benchmark. So this could potentially have an impact much more wider than the UK. And the, and the, the, the US trade deal, um, there are, it will impact you know, the health of our nation in, in numerous ways. Um, the, the race to the bottom on food standards, on health labeling, um, on environmental standards, that will impact the health of us all, but it would disproportionately impact those um, who have the least means in our society. And um, to finish, you know, I think you know, it can, after the year that we've had, it can, it can feel, um, it can feel quite disheartening, you know, we're up against a Tory majority, we're up against massive corporate interests, but we are not powerless. Um, so when I, I started the petition last year to protect our NHS from a trade bill, um, over a million people have signed that petition. And a recent poll showed that 75% of the British public are on our side on this. So, we can win this fight. And to be frank, this is a fight that we just simply cannot afford to lose. Um, so please, let's get organised, you know, join Keep Our NHS Public. Let's, let's build a movement to fight against those who want to profit from ill health. And let us fight for a society that puts people and their health and their well-being and our environment before profit. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you, Sonia. Um, if, if ever there was a case for keeping the NHS in public hands, this right now, in for so many ways, this is it, isn't it? Um, uh, so now we're going to hear from um, Dr. Phil Hammond, um, who uh, many of you will have heard of, I'm sure, an um, NHS GP who currently works um, in a specialist NHS centre for children and adolescents with chronic fatigue syndrome and ME. Um, and he's also a journalist known for his private eye column, um, Medicine Balls. So he, we, have a, we have a video message from him, which is going to, uh, I think, reiterate quite a lot of um, what you've said, Sonia, about the, about the, the big threats of privatisation in the NHS. Hello, wonderful. Keep our NHS public people. How are you doing? Uh, I'm Dr. Phil Hammond. Been an NHS doctor for 33 years now, 20 years in general practice, a few years in sexual health. Uh, and for the last 10 years, I've been working in a paediatric unit for young people with severe fatigue, including post-viral fatigue, chronic fatigue syndrome, ME. Uh, and we're waiting now to see whether long COVID uh, causes as much harm to children as lost education. Because I guess that's been one of the big messages um, of this pandemic is that we need to look at risk in the round. And we've known that the pandemic and the government's response to the pandemic has selectively harmed the most poor uh, in our society, the very people the NHS was set up to serve. Your campaigns are even more important than ever now. I've written for Private Eye for over 30 years and one of the lessons we've learned there is that outsourcing is never the answer to anything. Uh, if we go right back to the health and social care bill, my only ever uh, appearance on Question Time with Andrew Lansley saying that this would splinter up the NHS, make it very hard to coordinate a response. And there's lots of documented evidence of public health experts back then saying if you have public health outsourced all over the place, uh, we don't know whether the NHS or local authorities are officially in charge and then Public Health England floating at the top, it'll make it impossible to coordinate a pandemic. Uh, and so it has proved. Uh, we also know that the pandemic can be used uh, undercover to push through things we know will be dangerous, such as putting the NHS on the table in any trade deal with America. Sometimes it's hard to get the cut through in the media when everything is about the virus. We're relentlessly uh, reminded of one risk, uh, but we don't balance it with all the other risks. So yes, we need an NHS reinstatement bill. Yes, we need to keep our NHS public. Uh, yes, we may still need to use the private sector in some instances when we simply don't have the capacity. But the point is we need a unified system that joins up. The failure of track and trace uh, was predictable uh, because we outsourced a huge great chunk of it uh, to people without perhaps uh, the appropriate expertise 
We ignored the local experts and the countries that have been onto this quickly don't just do test and trace. They do what I call fetish. Find, explain, test, trace, isolate, help and support or even support and help. That would be better. Uh, and perhaps even a home visit. Uh, we know that if you want to control a pandemic, you need to use local people with local expertise who are locally trusted. And we don't have that. So don't despair. Our time will come, but keep putting that message forward and delighted to be able to support you uh, in this very important conference. Look after yourselves. Bye for now. Thanks to Dr. Phil Hammond there. Um, and so next we're gonna have Professor Molly Scott Cato. Um, and Molly's an economist and community activist um, and the Green Party spokesperson on finance and Brexit. Um, she was also a Green, the Green M MEP for the Southwest of England from 2014 until January of this year um, and served on the European Parliament's Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs. Thank you, Molly. Thank you very much, Liz, and thank you everybody for being here today. And thank you, especially if you went out and rallied in the rain, because I'm trying to whip you up from my living room and I very much enjoy having all your energy against this dreadful trade deal with the US coming into my living room. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the relationship between what's happening here and the failings of our democracy, because this isn't just about a trade deal. This is about the way these Tories in government now are using the trade deal to undermine our democracy and to do things that most people in the country don't want. And they know that, and that's why they're using trade deals as a way of, of doing things that they could not do in a democratic way. Now, quite a few people could see this coming with Brexit, and that's why a lot of us were opposed to Brexit. And I set up a website called the Brexit Syndicate, and it explains very clearly how this is a sort of culmination of decades of planning by US oligarchs setting up fake think tanks, uh, basically setting up alternative structures of power that are working against our democracy. A lot of people, especially some of the, the richest US citizens have explicitly said this, they're just not prepared to have the sort of changes that we've made through our democratic elections, through electing politicians to nationalize our health service, to have high standards of environmental protection, to make sure that animal welfare is protected, that farmers are paid properly, all of that stuff, they just will not countenance it. But because it works for the majority, there's nothing they can do about it democratically. So what they've done is deliberately attack our democracy through all sorts of artificial fake think tanks who keep getting into our media, through uh, sending out propaganda at the time of elections and through stealing our data to manipulate those elections. So what we're about here is not just stopping a trade deal, although we must do that and we can do that as we stop TTIP, but we're also about protecting and standing up for democracy and actually making sure that for the first time in our history, Britain actually has a real democracy. Because as I'm with Gandhi over this, when he was asked, what do you think of British civilization? He said, I think it would be a good idea. And I feel the same about British democracy. You know, we've never really had a democracy and we see now how vulnerable we are to attacks by, by the rich and wealthy. And it's our job to not just stand up for democracy, but also to fight for a, a true democracy. So I would say at the moment, our democracy is clearly not working. If we lived in a democracy, it wouldn't be a question whether we feed our children or not. It wouldn't be a question whether we keep our NHS public. The vast majority of people in this country want that to happen. It wouldn't be a question whether we have high animal welfare standards on farms. Most British people want those things. The reason we're having to fight so hard for them is because our democracy is not working. We've got a crappy electoral system that gives too much power to the Tories that they exploit, and we've got the wrong government. We haven't got a government that represents us. So to me, this is a battle against the oligarchs, against the rich and wealthy, against the big corporations who dominate the global economy. And it's for us, it's for citizens, it's in the tradition of people who stood up and fought for our democracy. And that's our job now, to defend our democracy and to defend what's best for the British people. Now, you know, that they may talk all this nonsense about global Brexit, but Britain is not strong enough on its own in the world to set, to set trade standards and or to have much power in trade negotiations. There are three blocks that matter, China, the EU and the US. As an MEP, I saw very clearly that the EU had the highest standards uh, in the world on environmental and social issues. Of course, they weren't high enough for me and I was always fighting to make them higher. 
But the point of Brexit was to bust us out of that system, to get us then working with the US to, uh, to attack and undermine those standards. So Brexit was part of this attack on the democracy and the improved lives that we fought for. Remember, we've only had democracy in the sense of everybody voting for just over 100 years. It's still an experiment. It's an experiment that the wealthy don't like and they're attacking it. So please continue to fight this trade deal. It doesn't actually matter that much, I don't think, who wins the US election. Any trade deal with the US is gonna be a really serious attack on our NHS and on our social and environmental standards. So it's great to see you out there being active today. Please carry on. Um, yeah, we're, we're energized, we can stop this, but when we stop this, we also have to make sure that we fight for a, for a stronger and better democracy in this country. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Molly. Um, that's a great reminder to keep, get involved everybody. If you're not already, I'm guessing most of you will be if you're here today, but keep, keep involved um, with any of the organizations that, that are organizing this today um, or any, anybody locally that you can um, campaign with. Um, so um, we're going to now um, hear from Dave Prentice, um, and Dave is the General Secretary of the UK's largest union, Unison, um, representing 1.3 million workers employed in the public and voluntary sectors and in private companies who provide public services. Um, he's also President of Public Services International, which is the world body that represents public service workers from across the globe. Um, so I'll hand over to you now, Dave. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to be with all of you at your rally and uh, day of action today. And uh, Unison and myself, we're, we're proud to have campaigned with War and Wants and Global Justice Now for many years against toxic trade deals. Together, we have helped stop TTIP, a major victory, and together, we are now determined to get real trade democracy and fairness, not just in the UK, but across the world. And we began campaigning together back in the 1990s, when we saw the dangers that the General Agreement on Trade in Services posed to public services. Public services to be sold off on the altar of privatization. And together, since then, we have stood firm against the, attempt, the attempts to enforce service liberalization and privatization in successive trade agreements. And thanks to all of that campaigning, thanks to everybody's involvement, there is now far greater public awareness about the threat to our public services from trade agreements. Even the government's own public consultation on UK trade was forced to recognize the strength of public feeling, especially on the threat to our National Health Service. And because of all your campaigning, the Tories were forced to concede that they would not include the NHS in any UK US trade deal. You'll believe that when you see it. But we need to do far, far more. The, uh, the Tory government has got no scruples. This Tory government has already opened up our NHS in England to liberalization and private healthcare providers through its own Health and Social Care Act. It's scandalous. Large parts of our NHS are or have been handed over to the private sector. And that is why we all have to be vigilant. Because of our fight, we won't see probably health explicitly included in a UK-US trade agreement. But that doesn't mean that our NHS has been protected. There is much, much more that we have to do. And our NHS, our welfare state, can still be undermined by a US trade deal. Uh, we've seen it happen around the world. Tra trade agreements, which include clauses, such as the standstill and ratchet clause, that lock in existing liberalization measures. Such a clause in any UK US trade deal would prevent any income in Labour government from reversing the privatization of our NHS imposed by the Health and Social Care Act. And the European Union-Canada Agreement, CETA, already has this clause for postal services, making it impossible to roll back post-liberalization and privatization. And the same applies to other privatized public services, whether it's social care, the railways, or many local government services. And that is why we still 
need to fight. Fight to ensure that there are no standstill or ratchet clauses in any deal. Now, friends, and it's not just a ratchet clause, it's then the, the terribly named Investor to State Dispute Settlement Mechanism, ISDS. Unbelievably, this ISDS allows transnational companies to sue governments in private investment tribunals for any decision the private company doesn't like. Unbelievably, it's already happening across the world in some trade deals. And that is why together we must oppose any ISDS in any deal in any part of the world. And we know about President Trump. He's been very explicit that the US are insisting on including pricing of medicines in any deal. Uh, we've already heard this from Sonia, the, the sheer scale of NHS medicines means that the NHS is able to negotiate much lower prices than major pharmaceuticals in the private hospital sector in the US. Trump wants to force up the price of medicines in the UK to lower the cost in the US, but we will not let him do it. Finally, I just want to mention something that's not very talked about very often, but data is the new battleground in trade deals. Big corporations want access to our data, whether it's Google or Facebook, data sells. And health corporations want access to NHS data so that they can develop new health technologies and make profits from them for themselves. It's already happening. Babylon provides NHS GP appointments on mobile phone apps, not because many people find it hard to get a GP appointment, but because of their ability to use the data they are gathering to grow their business globally. Again, we know because the US makes no secret of, secrets of it, that weakening data protection laws is the key US trade objective in any UK deal. Friends, your healthcare data should be private and protected. We don't want people with pre-existing conditions being denied healthcare coverage as it happens in the US. And I want to conclude uh, this evening by making it clear that our concerns, Unison's concerns about the UK-US trade deal are wider than just the NHS. Food safety, environmental protection, regulations for cosmetics, everyday pharmaceuticals are all at risk. And that, that's why Unison will continue to campaign with War on One and Global Justice Now and all public service unions around the world, including America, for the maximum transparency in trade talks and real parliamentary scrutiny of the detail of any deal before it can be signed or approved. Across the world, and here in the UK, we will work together, campaign together to protect our NHS, our public services, services provided for all our communities, protect our welfare state and that fairer society that we all fight for. The, um, you know, the, the, the issues are massive. It's not just them at the side. These are real issues which all of us have got to come together and fight and make sure that our voice is heard. Thank you all very much. That, thank you, Dave. Um, so yeah, we we need to fight on so many fronts <laughs> um, to protect to protect regulations, protect our public services, to stop the ISDS, um, and um, to, and and of course in the area of data and big tech, which takes us on to. Uh, Glyn Moody, who's our next speaker. And um, Glyn is, is an author, journalist, and blogger who's been writing about the internet, um, free software, copyright, patents, and digital rights for over 25 years. So thank you, Glyn. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dave, for doing that intro to my section, because you're absolutely right. The, the data side of things is incredibly important. In fact, people tend to overlook this when they think about trade deals. They tend to think about all the other things that we know about. If you think about it, you know, you're watching me on this digital platform, the digital world now is actually seeping into everything we do. And therefore, it is a very important aspect of trade deals. 
And it's not just data, it's not just the things we look at online or the things we buy, it's also what's called metadata. And metadata is data about data. In other words, who you contact, how long you're online for. And from that kind of metadata, you can actually find out most things about a person's life. In fact, to the extent that the former director of the NSA and CIA, General Michael Hyden, once said, we kill people based on metadata. So data and metadata are incredibly important. If something is important, it's obviously valuable. And that's why we've seen the rise of companies like Google and Facebook, which now are basically trillion dollar companies. And that trillion dollars of worth is based on data, personal data, your personal data. Um, it's based on gathering as much information as they can about you online and then extrapolating from that what your interests are so they can sell your advertising or what you're interested in buying. And so these companies, which basically rule the online world and have immense impact and influence outside it, are founded on your personal data. But it's not just these surveillance capitalist companies, as Shoshana Zuboff calls them, uh, that want your data. The American government is very interested. And it happens that there is a law called FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which lets them demand your personal data from companies like Google and Facebook. So when you use Google and Facebook, that data is sent to the US and then the US government is able to demand it. Um, so bearing in mind the power of that data and how much they can actually work out from it, that's pretty problematic. So that's why the US companies and indeed the US government want data to flow freely across the Atlantic. Against that, you have the, the EU approach. I'm sure many of you know about the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which basically protects data and takes the view that we should be stopping people from abusing that personal data. And in fact, just recently, there's been some very important court cases at the CJEU, the Court of Justice of the European Union, that says our personal data, or EU personal data now, cannot be sent to the US because it is insufficiently protected there. And that's because of this FISA Act that gives the US government access to our personal data. So the question is, what's the UK gonna do after the 1st of January? Uh, and unfortunately, we know what it's gonna do because it published a national data strategy last month. And one of the five priority areas of that strategy is championing the international flow of data. The UK government wants data to flow as freely as possible so that new businesses can be created and money can be made. And so the UK government unfortunately agrees with the US approach to data. It wants to actually have it flowing out of the UK to the US as easily as possible. It wants companies to essentially take up a kind of digital extractivism to get as much value as possible from that data. And so we know what the effect of having a trade deal would be with the US. It would have uh, the impact of ensuring as much personal data flowed from the UK to the US with as few constraints as possible. And there's one other thing which I'd just like to conclude on to mention is that once personal data, or indeed any kind of data, is released, you can't get it back. It's one of these things that it's a, a one-off opportunity. You either stop it getting out, or once it's out, you've lost control. So if we really want to maintain some semblance of control over our personal data and to stop the kind of things being done with it which are eminently possible, then we really need to make sure that those data flows to the US don't happen. And so we really need to make sure that that uh, isn't in the trade uh, deal, which it probably will be, or better still, just to stop the trade deal completely. Thank, thank you, Glenn. Um, and now, um... It's great that we've got uh, a voice from the US. So we've heard um, many uh, from the UK, many voices now from the UK, um, and that we know that there are hundreds of thousands of us here that are against this trade deal. Um, it's it's really reassuring to, um, to I think to sense this really broad based movement. Um, and it, even here tonight, there are five hundred and forty of you um, online. So um, that in itself is really encouraging. Um, and so it's. Um, it's great now to um, ask Sharon 
um, treat to speak. Um, and Sharon is a senior attorney at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy in the US. Um, and for more than a decade, a major focus of her policy work has included international trade agreements and their intersection um, with environmental food and public health policy. Um, and she's a key ally of trade campaigners in the UK and Europe. So thank you, Sharon. Thank you and good evening to everyone. I'm really happy to be able to join you from the state of Maine up in the far northeast corner of the US on the North Atlantic. So we're pretty much the closest place you can get to the UK uh, from the United States. Um, as, as has been said, I work for the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy and that organization advocates for trade policies that don't promote extractive corporate agribusiness models and that don't threaten biodiversity and that don't massively contribute to global warming. And that's why last um, month we teamed up with Sustain in the UK to jointly submit evidence to the UK Parliament on why it's so important to include high food and animal welfare standards in the law. Um, a trade degree deal with the US could really lower food quality and threaten farmers' livelihoods by threat flooding the UK with cheap meat uh, produced on polluting factory farms with few protections for animals and processed in meatpacking plants with abusive labor practices and right now a total disregard for COVID um, safety. A trade deal also makes it harder to reform those practices here in the US. And I'm one of many people here that would like to change the direction of many of our policies, including trade policy and agricultural policy. You've all heard about chlorinated chicken, but it's a real thing. And so is chicken processed with other chemicals used to sanitize meat instead of requiring and monitoring cleanliness from the farm to the slaughterhouse, to the supermarket, and finally to your kitchen table. These newer chemicals, such as parasitic acid, can be even more harmful to workers. And so that's a real concern as well. U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Sonny Perdue and U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer have stated in no uncertain terms that a trade deal with the U.K. must allow not only chicken treated with chemicals, but also pork that's been fed the drug ractopamine, which is banned in the EU and many other countries around the world, but not in the U.S., as well as meat grown with overused antibiotics. I can't imagine why the UK government would refuse to put into law the strong food standards that already apply and that Liz Truss and others insist will never be undermined, except that otherwise they won't be able to conclude a trade deal with the US or with other countries that do not abide by these standards. The story of what a UK-US trade deal could threaten, however, goes far beyond chicken, as you know we've already heard tonight. US negotiators are now using the new NAFTA trade deal with Canada and Mexico, called the USMCA, as a template for trade negotiations with other countries, including the UK. That agreement includes provisions not only on pharmaceuticals and data, as you've heard, but chemicals, cosmetics, medical devices, and so-called good regulatory practices, all of which threaten to undermine consumer protections and environmental standards. Just this month, the chemical industry, through its many lobbyists and many you know, different companies, have intervened in Canada claiming that proposed regulations banning single-use plastic bags and requiring producer responsibility for plastic waste violate the USMCA's regulatory practices provisions, which by the way are enforceable through a government-to-government -government dispute resolution. This follows reporting by Unearthed in the UK and in the New York Times here in the US that chemical and plastic industry lobbyists have been trying to get similar provisions into trade agreements with Kenya in order to thwart plastic bag bans that are already there in that country. The UK's plastic straw ban, not to mention more comprehensive plastics policies, as well as proposals to tackle obesity with mandatory labeling are surely at risk from a trade deal with the US. We know from leaked memos summarizing preliminary trade talks that US negotiators scoffed at the effectiveness of proposed UK labeling for sugary drinks, saying it could be a problem in these trade negotiations. US MCA provisions have already been cited by transnational processed food corporations to claim that Mexico's new food labeling laws, which 
directly address obesity violate trade law. Only a few of the 1,200 chemicals currently banned for safety reasons in UK cosmetics are likewise banned in the United States. PAN UK and Sustain have done great reporting on how the US allows many more pesticides classified as highly hazardous to be used on food and how pesticide residues are frequently much higher on food than in the, in the US than in the UK. These are just a few examples. U.S. negotiators explicitly reject a precautionary approach to regulating. The bottom line is a trade agreement with the U.S. could end up moving the U.K. to adopt the U.S. approach to regulating, either explicitly, as in the Canadian plastics example, or by flooding the market with UK, U.S. products that don't meet current U.K. standards and then pushing down those standards as a result. I commend everybody for coming out on a Saturday night to make your voices heard. It's only in the middle of the day here in Maine. Trade policy affects everyone and we can't leave it to multinational corporations to influence it. It's our future and we need to be in charge. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Sharon. Um, it's, yeah, but it's really no exaggeration to say that we, with the US trade deal, we wouldn't just be importing US goods, but the importing the US regulatory system, um, which could be a huge threat to the, all, the, all the very hard won protections that we have here for food, environment and, um, and so many other areas. So thank you very much for that. Um, next, we have a, um, uh, a short video, a solidarity message really, um, from the Citizens Trade Campaign in the US, um, which is a coalition of environmental, labor, consumer, family, farm, religious, and other civil society groups, all united in a common belief that international trade and investment are not just ends in themselves, but rather must be viewed as a means for achieving economic justice, human rights, healthy communities, and a sound environment. Um, so, And earlier this year, um, members of the Citizen, Citizens Trade Campaign came together with UK groups and trade unions to demand that trade negotiations between the US and UK prioritise working families, public health and the environment over corporate profit. So we'll just hear that now. Hi, this is Will from California. This is Bob from Texas. This is Denise from Michigan. This is George from New York. This is Corey from Pennsylvania. And this is Hillary from Washington. We're here in solidarity from the United States on this important day of action. Let's be clear, this isn't a US trade deal. It's a rigged corporate trade deal. Everyone who cares about consumer safety, climate justice, food sovereignty, data privacy, quality health care, good paying jobs, or simply democratic decision making, we need to educate ourselves about what's at stake in these negotiations and mobilize others. Thank you for doing that already. And thank you for all your work to prevent a corporate power grab. We deeply appreciate all y'all are doing and we're gonna do what we can to have your backs. We have a lot of power when we work together across issue areas and across borders and together we can make a difference. Um, Thank you. I'm, I imagine people would be, if we could hear the audience at the moment, I hope the 540 people that are here, I think they'd be clapping. <laughs> I'm clapping here. Um, that's great. That's great to hear. Um, you know, the, so today's day of action across the UK in so many different places across the UK, towns and villages and cities um, and people online and then hearing that from the US, knowing that trade unions are on board, political, some of the political parties at least, um, plus all these organisations is a really, that's a, should be a really great place for us to finish the day I think today um, and I'm um, just um, going to give the final word to Assad Rayman from um, War on One but just before he does that I just wanted to say huge thank you um, to all our speakers um, this evening so to Glyn and Sonia and Molly and Sharon and Dave um, thank you very much indeed um, for joining us um, and for such great contributions. Thank you to Phil and to George Monbiot for the videos and of course to the Systems Trade Campaign in the US. Um, and please everyone, don't stop here. 
today's today we've shown you know this we've shown that we can make a huge noise when we get together um, and uh, and focus all focus our efforts and uh, we need to keep this going. This isn't the this isn't the end of the campaign, of course, by any means. Um, so let's keep going um, with a fight to stop a US UK trade deal. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to Assad, um, who is the executive director of War and Want. Thanks, Assad. Thank you, Liz, and uh, uh, it's always a, a real pleasure to one be on such a panel with so many uh, amazing friends and comrades, and to join all of you. And I and just to reiterate, it has been an amazing day, and we've heard from all of our speakers how this deal threatens, you know, our food, our digital rights, climate, our NHS, our rights as workers, our protections as citizens, and of course our democracy. But I think it's very, very important that we're absolutely clear. This, this isn't a deal that can be fixed. It has to be stopped. Because there are some, albeit a few people, who say maybe we can make this deal a little less bad. If that was the case, then we wouldn't have a deal that was negotiated in secret. We wouldn't have a deal where MPs aren't allowed to amend or vote on it. We wouldn't have a deal where despite all of the opportunities the government has refused to put into law the protections around our NHS or our food and farming standards. And again, there are some people, again, a few, who say, well, let's cross our fingers. You know, let's hope that the US presidential election turns out all right. And if we don't have a racist and a white supremacist in the White House, um, maybe everything will be different. But I think we should be very, very clear. It's no matter whether it's Trump or Biden, we should be under no illusion that this trade agenda that is being pursued is one being pursued by the US administration. And as long as big business sets that agenda, and as long as we have neoliberal trade agree deals, then these deals will, are all designed to do the same thing, to maximize corporate profits and to roll back our regulations. And that none of these deals are ever designed to protect us, to benefit people, or to protect our world. So as you've heard, this isn't about the US versus the UK. We've heard from our comrades and friends over in the US who are campaigning against these trade deals in the same way. This is about fundamentally a question about people versus corporations. And for War on One, you know, and for our partners and our allies who work also at a global level with our, uh, across the global south, we all know the reality of what these trade agreements are. First, they're not free. Neither are they actually about trade. And of course, they're not about reaching an agreement. If we look around the world, we see, we see a world where half the world's population are barely surviving on less than $5 a day. We see a world racked by extreme inequality. We see billions going hungry each and every day. And of course, we see the reality of COVID and how that's exposed all the deep racial, economic and social inequalities, both within our own societies and of course, globally. And it brought home to, I think, to more and more people, the importance of public services, uh, the importance of social protection, the importance of health, and when we look at what happened in the global south, the reality for more and more of the poorer countries that were denied the very basic tools to be able to protect their citizens, those are a result of these same kind of trade deals, the same neoliberal trade agenda, the same neoliberal mantra of deregulation, of forced privatization, and of locking and exploitation of people and the resources. Um, we see it in, in the reality of the fact that in Ecuador, we had the dead lying unburied whilst the Ecuadorian government was making debt repayments. We see it in the reality in India of migrant workers being forced to walk hundreds if not thousands of kilometers because of a lack of social protection, because of trade agreements. We see it in the reality across the whole of Africa of countries where, even, where 46 countries have either one intensive care bed uh, why? Because our trade agreements, these trade agreements, have gutted the ability of countries in the global south to be able to protect their citizens or protect their economies. They are forced upon 
the poorest countries by the richest countries. Over the last few decades, we've seen this ripping open of economies, of trashing of lively, lives and livelihoods, of wrecking local food systems, and of course, handing power to corporations. And this is what has brought us to the brink of all of these multiple crises that we see, right? This multiple crisis of the climate crisis that is already destroying the lives and livelihoods of so many people. Uh, when we see the corona crisis, the pandemic, the crisis of global inequality. For the global south, these trade agreements are simply the latest tool in an arc of exploitation that is colonial in nature. They're about locking in the exploitation of resources, of wealth and of people for not for the interests of ordinary people here in the global north, but of course in the interests and for the profit of the wealthiest. And that's why, you know, these trade regimes, you know, when we talk about often, you know, amongst our activist circles, you know, we say, oh, what's going to come is disaster capitalism, right? That the answer of the corporations is going to be disaster capitalism. Um, we already can see that disaster capitalism in these trade agreements. We can see the broken economic system that sacrifices people and our planet. And at the heart of that sits, of course, all of these free trade agreements. So if we want to be able to turn away from these multiple crises towards a vision of a just and sustainable world, if we want to take, move from crisis to justice, whereas you've heard, we are able to tackle the, the climate crisis and deliver climate justice. And remember, you know, we're talking about, you know, a, a world where we've already breached 1.1 degrees warming and we've seen killer floods, droughts and famines wrecking all over the world. And we're heading not to just breaching the 1.5 degree guardrail, but we're heading towards at least a warming of two and a half degrees, if not even more. Despite all of the evidence on there, we see, of course, the economic injustice around the world. We see what's happening with racialized and gendered inequality and injustice, not only within our own societies, but of, of, of globally. If we want to fix those, if we want to deliver, not just uh, tackling the debt crisis, but ensuring people in the global south have the resources and they have the ability of their, of their governments to be able to protect themselves and to be able to grow cleanly and deliver the much needed services, then we have to have not just a vision of the world that we want, but we have to fight for that vision. And of course, this is the fight of all fights. Trade is what links all of our fights together. And that's really important for us because often I think, you know, we ask ourselves, we, you know, we can analyze the problem. We say, oh my God, look how shocking it is. And then we worry about what we can do. And I think there is a lot that we can do. We've heard today, you know, all of these regulations, all of these victories we've had, all the things that we protect, were of course never handed to us. They were won by ordinary people organizing. Our NHS was won by ordinary people organizing. Our welfare system was won. Our food standards was won by us organizing. So we have to build power. And that first thing that building power is of course, we need to educate people. So yes, let's talk to our friends and our family. But of course we also need to take action. So let's hold the feet of MPs to, fight, to the fire. If you haven't done so already, you know, write to your MP. You can go to the War on Want website. Uh, I think it might appear in, in the chat soon. Uh, there's a link, very, very easy, about how you can write to your MP. And I, and I read, of course, in the chat about how so many MPs are torn deaf to their constituents on this. But we've got to keep ramping up pressure, right? And of course, we, and, and similarly, I think there is a, a petition on the Global Justice Now website of building more and more people because we showed we did that under TTIP. We showed when we got harnessed and galvanized people, we built power of citizens and ordinary people against the power of corporations. But we've also got to build this movement of movements. We've got to connect activists. We've got to connect groups. And again, Global Justice Now has local groups. Please go onto their website, find the local groups, connect your groups together to build our power at a local level, to expose the reality of what this trade agreement is. Because too many people, I think, are unclear or unsure what these trade agreements are about. It's our job to educate people and to be in touch with each other. This isn't a fight that is over today, and it, it won't be a fight that's even over tomorrow. It's a fight that is going to be at the center of all of our vision of a better world. 
So again, I think there's a Slack channel for trade activists. You know, please connect that because I remember, uh, I'll show my age, I remember when we built our movement against the WTO in Seattle, when we built the movements against GATS, ordinary people were educated about the trade agreements. We knew as much about those trade agreements and what was under threat. And ordinary people took on their job to go and educate other people, to connect our local, local faith organizations and churches and little old grannies knew more about GATS and knew about that threat. That's what we've got to do. We've got to educate people, and we've got to empower people. And of course, we have to be honest about the scale of this job. We face a government that is committed to prioritizing corporate benefits. We can see it, yeah, handing over 12 billion to a private company for a failed private, privatized uh, test and trace system, and yet refusing to help you know, the very uh, children who are going hungry, the very product of the trade liberalization of the unregulated labor market that these trade agreements are designed to create. But there is an upside because more and more people are asking this question, what is our economy for? Who does it serve? Whose interest does it protect? Why is it that the poor are getting poorer and the rich are getting richer? And I think in that, we have an opportunity, not just to fight, but to win. But to win, you know, that relies on not somebody else doing something. It relies on all of us connecting, working together, building our power. So hopefully today's rally is just the next step of us building the kind of movement that's needed to be able to not just defeat this US-UK trade deal, but ensure we have genuine trade democracy and we have genuine trade justice, not just for the UK to the US, but for the UK to also the, uh, to the global south, and that we link up with trade campaigners all around the world because we have one common fight. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Assad. Um, okay, so folks, let's um, keep in touch. Let's all keep active if, because if we stand together on this, we can, we know we can win. Um, so do con keep in touch with the organizations that have organized tonight's event. Uh, keep your, as, as Asa said, keep your politicians feet to the fire. Uh, keep the work, get it out in your local media if you can, talk to, talk to your friends, family, your local communities. Um, and yeah, together we can beat this. So um, I just wanted to finish now by just thanking very much once again, um, all our speakers. Um, <clears throat> it's been um, made a, uh, a really interesting um, and uh, energizing hour there. Um, and then very lastly, to thank um, everybody who's come along tonight. Um, as, as we've said, this isn't the end. Um, let's, let's keep this, this up because together we can win. So thanks very much, everyone.